I've got what I think is an outstanding lesson that should be fun for a lot of people. And I called it the world's zoo because this world that we live in is like a zoo in ways that are described in God's word. Is this whole world concealed inside of iron bars? And what are the creatures inside these iron bars being held captive? What is their identity? In Hosea chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 18 through 20. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beast of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and I will make them to lie down safely, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yeah, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. I think that's a very comforting and merciful uh, set of verses there in the book of Hosea. And I'd like to point out that there's spiritual vocabulary there. For example, break the bow. Is the bow symbolic of a tongue that shoots arrows that are words? And is the sword symbolic of the word of God? Having this type of spiritual discernment, you get a deeper meaning out of what's going on. A zoo is a place that people know that it's a facility, usually indoor and outdoor settings, where living typically wild animals are kept, especially for public exhibition. It's also a term to describe a place or situation or group marked by crowding, confusion, or being unrestrained. So I want to put out those definitions before proceeding and talk about what Jesus says. In Matthew 13, Jesus Christ says, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Just because somebody thinks they're a Christian, or they're on the internet, or they come across a video, doesn't mean that they're actually a Christian and dwelt with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean they have any spiritual discernment. So Christians get messages in Scripture that natural people cannot receive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And in John chapter 9, And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. God's word is for saved people on a spiritual level. If you're not saved, it is plain speech so that you can come to faith, receive the Holy Spirit, and then receive spiritual things that natural people, unsaved, cannot receive. In Revelation chapter 2, we're reminded as Christians, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So you can read something in God's Word, and it will not sink in spiritually to someone that doesn't have the Holy Spirit in them. So I just wanted to lay that out before proceeding. So do beasts in God's Word symbolize things? It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them and that they might see that they are themselves are beast. So, therefore, beasts are people in Scripture on a spiritual level, at minimal. So, that's what this lesson is dedicated to, and I think it'll be enjoyable for people to pause and study as I go through the slides and material here. So, the field... Wallowing in mire, we've got beast all over the field. Beast of the field representing unsaved people. So there's all sorts of animal life that are described in Scripture. And God is going to use those animals to give counsel to people. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. 
So, the first one I'm going to pick is a wild ass, symbolic of an unsaved person. It says in Job chapter 11, For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. It says elsewhere in Job chapter 5, Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. So, people are born in a state of trouble. You're born unsaved. And God describes, he uses one term as like a wild ass's colt, for example, to describe the stubborn, rebellious people that have not yet heard God's voice and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. Another beast is called a dromedary, uh, more commonly known as a camel to most people. But a dromedary is a specific type of camel an Arabian camel, which symbolizes a professing believer drinking miry water of idolatry. In other words, a person full of themselves, feeding on corrupt scriptures, filling their belly with miry, bitter water. It says in Jeremiah chapter 2, How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley, know what thou hast done, Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways. So God describes in the book of Jeremiah a stubborn person as a dromedary, again, consuming miry, polluted water, which is symbolic of corrupt scripture, not listening or believing through faith, rather being full of themselves and not, uh, not concerning themselves with anything else. The king of the field, the field is the world, behemoth, it says in Job chapter 40, verse 18, his bones are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. The field is the world, which is Babylon. Refer to Matthew chapter 13, John chapter 17, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for example. We've got the king of Babylon in the field here. Behemoth. He wants to be like the Most High, and he is the chief of the ways of God. He's also known as Lucifer. He eats grass as an ox, and you can see some of the scriptures that tie into each other on the screen there. But unlike the rest of the beast in the field, the king of Babylon, his bones are like bars of iron. He has access to God to accuse the rest of the beast. So he is not necessarily going to stay behind bars like the rest of the beast in the field. So we're going to go to the cat house. If you've been to a zoo before, there's typically a place called the cat house. Strong, subtle, and scary are what I would describe most types of cats at the zoo, such as lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, etc. So a lion is symbolic of Jesus Christ. See Revelation chapter 5. Also, God describes Lucifer as a lion, and Leviathan, otherwise known as the Antichrist, or Antichrist, always in the world, as a lion as well. And then uh, God describes himself as a lion, God and Jesus Christ being the same. So, wanted people to pause and study there. It's important that we understand. Continuing on in the cat house, we've got the leopards. Leopards are very hard to see, sometimes nearly invisible out in the field. Representing unsaved people, Lucifer, Leviathan Antichrist, and God. God observes people as a leopard. We can't see God, and we can't see the devil unless God has a purpose, and Antichrist is concealed, but God will not conceal him always, as it says in Job chapter 41. The rodent house, loving darkness. If you go to John chapter 3 verse 19, men love darkness because their deeds are evil, or were evil. Okay, so God uses rodents 
to describe people that love darkness. A bat is described as an unsaved person in Isaiah chapter 2. The same with the mole. Moles love to get down into the mire and tunnel and dig. And both bats and moles have no sight, no vision, which is important because if you look at a lot of modern Bibles, they, they change the word sub subtly. Instead of a mole, it might say rodent or something like that. Well, rodents, many of them can see, but moles cannot see. And that's what God is talking about, a person that has no sight, no spiritual sight. Okay, uh, someone that is going to open up a corrupt modern Bible and read about behemoth and think that it's an elephant or a hippopotamus, for example. Or Leviathan is a crocodile or a dinosaur. That type of stuff. They have no spiritual vision. Mouse, also an unsaved person, see Isaiah chapter 66. So wanted to lay out these uh, terms for people, again, to pause and study. Hopefully you'll have fun with this. Be a fun way to learn things. Night creatures, loving darkness, owls are devils. See the verses I reference in scripture on the screen there. Dragons and satyrs, devils. See the reference to them that I put on the screen as well. The monkey house, mischievous, apes, unsaved people. Great lesson in 1 Kings goes way over the heads of nearly everyone on earth who even thinks they're Christians. You need to get an AV 1611 Bible. Then the Holy Ghost will teach you about apes and how important they are as far as the lesson in that chapter. Okay, they're an important part of the merchandise and it goes all the way up to modern teachings today. I'm not going to get sidetracked with doctrine, but that's very critical that you understand that apes represent unsaved people uh, and where they reside in 1 Kings chapter 10 is critical to what we need to know today. Bigfoot, devils, see those references in scripture there. Uh, that's more of an advanced lesson, but certainly uh, making a mockery and using Charles Darwin theories and being confounded about Bigfoot and all these um, fallen angels, evil spirits is part of what Evil angels, the devils that are with us here in this world, that's part of their role. That's what they do. God casts them down. The whole world is deceived. The farm, time to eat, rise from sleep. People are uh, sleeping. But first, I want to go through what a cockerel or a cock and rooster is. God the Father is described as that in his word. We have a cockatrice, which is Lucifer, which is a perverted version of the cock, the rooster. Continuing on, we've got a hen. Jesus Christ is described as a hen. Antichrist is also described as a counterfeit perversion of a hen. Chickens or vipers are what their offspring are. So that's important that people recognize that because there's some really great lessons in God's word that go into this further. Christians are described as chickens, baby chicks, uh, because they're the offspring of Jesus Christ. They're born of the spirit. And then unsaved people are Children of the devil, essentially. So you can see those verses there, pause and study. But, uh, you know, you, you don't want to be a viper coming out of an egg. You want to you wanna be a chick in the context of what God teaches in his word. People being animals, beast. The farm, time to eat. Sheep, Christians are described as sheep. Rams, Jesus Christ. Pastors king or kings. 
Continuing on, we've got an ox. Christians are described as an ox. You have to read Isaiah chapter 1. Maybe professing Christians would be a better way to say it there. You got Lucifer described as an ox. And also symbolic of unsaved people, depending on the context in God's word. So that's important that we understand that. The aquarium, going to the aquarium at the zoo. I'm sure many people have been to that part of the zoo before, playing in water. You've got a fish. Fish are symbolic of people. Also, Antichrist is described as a fish. Uh, a great fish. A whale, in fact. Then you've got the aquarium playing in water. You've got sea monsters. The church is described as being sea monsters. Antichrist is described as being a sea monster. Leviathan is described as being a sea monster. So this is important because a lot of modern Bibles take the word sea monster out and they replace it with something else that really doesn't make much sense. So it's important to understand that it's a sea monster. What is the sea spiritually? You need to know that as a Christian to understand what God is counseling the churches on. Plain in water, horse leeches, false church. A lot of people are confused about what a horse leech is. Uh, it explains it in Proverbs chapter 30, Job 39, 30. Revelation 18, Ezekiel 23, and above all, Job chapter 20, verse 16, which is linked to Job 39, 30. Very important that everyone that considers himself a Christian understand what a horse leech is. Okay, it's a false church, and the daughters are Jerusalem and Samaria, harlot daughters that, uh, that stray away from the truth. It's a major theme throughout the Word of God, and it goes over the head of almost everyone, especially those that don't have an unbroken testimony. The field, plain and dirt, ostriches represent the church that usually gets themselves in some type of trouble. Wallowing in dirt, which is mire, swine, people, or church usually getting themselves in trouble because of idolatry. Antichrist uh, as well. Field, in dust or dirt, you've got a viper or a serpent, which are false church leaders, representing also Satan and Antichrist. So these are things that are important to understand, pause and study based on your conviction. The beast of the field are saved and not harmed by Satan if you have Jesus Christ's power. Okay, in Isaiah chapter 11 it says, And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. So if you retained what we reviewed earlier, you realize that like an asp is similar to a viper, and a cockatrice is a counterfeit to... God, God the Father. So you're not going to be harmed by Satan in this world if you have the power of Jesus. If you're covered by the blood of the Lamb and you have his word, his testimony written in your forehead. But if you're unsaved, see Deuteronomy chapter 32, here's what's going to happen. In Job chapter 20, God says, The unsaved people shall suck the poison of asp, the viper's tongue shall slay him. So they're going to die in their iniquity because the viper's tongue, Lucifer's casting doubt on the word of God, is going to keep them in their unsaved natural state until they die a natural death. Okay? You don't want that to happen to you because this is what it says in Job chapter 39. Her young ones also suck up blood, and where the slain are, there is he. What, what is that referencing? The horse leech. 
her young ones, Jerusalem, Jerusalem and Samaria, who are constantly backsliding or, or getting caught in idolatry, are sucking up Babylonian doctrine, blood, but not the blood that saves, but the blood that corrupts, and they're slayed by the viper's tongue. So you can see how those two work together. The word suck is critical because sucking the poison of asp is equivalent to sucking up Babylonian blood, and where the slain are, there is he, ultimately representing Lucifer, whose carcass, Leviathan, has been given for meat for the beast of the field. It says that in the book of Ezekiel chapter 29, as well as Job chapter 41. So all these teachings, precept upon precept, fit together to give us lessons as Christians. So the wilderness, if you've been to the zoo or a zoo, you've probably seen wolves, coyotes, or some type of variety, maybe foxes. And in the case of wolves, wolves are symbolic of unsaved people and also corrupt leaders who are also affected by devils. So you can pause and study those verses there. And then again, it's important that you get a little bit of spiritual vocabulary, you start your own steady routine based on the convictions that God gives you. Where did the wolves of Babylon go? So you need an AV 1611 Bible because many of these modern Bibles have taken out references to wolves. What do wolves do? What sound do they make? They howl. So you've got howling going on all throughout Scripture, which is God's way of saying to a believer, I'm going to talk to you about wolves. Of course, the scholars don't understand God, so they change the word sometimes to what they think are equivalent synonyms like whale or something similar, but it destroys the teachings. So I just show a chart here just to give you guys an idea of how corrupt these modern Bibles are, and keeping people in a natural state is what their purpose is. Sleeping in the wilderness, bears, represent a sleeping person. See Matthew chapter 25, everybody's asleep, according to the parable of the virgins, both the wise and the foolish. The difference is the wise have oil in their lamps. They have Bibles that were written by the Spirit of God. And they tried the spirits in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and they were able to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And the foolish virgins, you know, they believed in their corrupt scriptures. Or they maybe they didn't. They just had them. They were never convicted. They never got born again. They were confounded. They never understood Jesus' voice. They never received spiritual things. And they were left out. They were not saved, which is a horrible tragedy, a terrible loss. Um, representing Babylon, the world of unsaved people, a slumbering world with their eyes shut. And also representing Satan, the wicked one. The wilderness, plain, the unicorn, represents God, represents Satan. Wilderness, great sight. You've got the eagle. Eagles are known for their vision. God describes himself as an eagle. Also, Satan, who wants to be like God, the Most High, is described as an eagle. And the church, described perhaps as young eagles there. So you guys can pause and study. We've got leaping in the wilderness, a heart, a rebellious leader dying of famine. So somebody that thinks they're a Christian and trying to lead people, but they themselves are famished and don't know what they're talking about. Also a thirsty soul. Someone that may be seeking the truth, but has not yet found it. And then a saved person is also described as a heart in the context of what's in Isaiah chapter 35. So please pause and study. Great for you to know and have this vocabulary.
The Wilderness, Sly and Subtle, Foxes, False Prophets, see Lamentation chapter 5, the Song of Solomon, for example, in chapter 2, verse 15, I think it says something about foxes. See also Ezekiel chapter 13. Very important to recognize them as false prophets. Corrupt prophets that are not giving a correct testimony according to the word of God. Foxes also represent the unsaved lost people. Wilderness, stump, stubborn. I mentioned this earlier. The ass is the church. Wendigo. Spiritual perversions of man and beast. Anyone that has read the word of God knows that Jesus Christ cast out many devils from people when he was uh, in the earth or on the earth with us. And those devils try to pervert and corrupt people, and they do. And there's different types of what I will call hybrid forms, one of them being a, what's what we call a wendigo, kind of a combination between a heart and a man that's perverted. See the Song of Solomon chapter 2, Leviathan is a devil that can manifest as a perverted heart. See Job chapter 41 verse 2 as well, where that wendigo gets a thorn in his jaw because of where he's feeding. Okay, he's perverted. And this is all crazy and wild to virtually everyone, but you need to get an unbroken testimony. You need to have faith. And once you do, the Lord will lead you to all truth based on his purpose for you. Werewolf, another perversion of man and beast. Uh, see the places that I reference in scripture there. Um, you know, God tells men to howl all throughout Scripture because they're full of themselves and they're rebelling against God. God's word is so powerful. If he tells somebody to howl, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to howl. And if, if his word is so powerful that by saying that he's going to make them howl, they may even transform to make a howling sound that they can't in their natural human state. Something to pray about and think about. I don't want to obsess on it. That's how powerful God's word is. And every word, unbroken testimony, gives spiritual vision beyond what a natural person can even comprehend. Then you've got another spiritual perversion of man and beast, shapeshifter. And this is something that happened to the king of Babylon in Daniel chapter 4. He had all different types of manifestations between being a man, an ox, an eagle, and a lion. In that chapter, again, it's going to go over the heads of virtually everyone. You need to get an unbroken testimony. You need to have faith. And then you will find in that chapter, there's references throughout the rest of Scripture to teach you what's going on with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon there. But he's definitely shape-shifting and at the same time, praising God with his mouth, which gives us insight into the nature of the king of Babylon. So recognizing that God describes people in captivity as beast is key in understanding his word. The scriptures take on a spiritual meaning when the Holy Spirit teaches out of the AV 1611. Beast manifest in many forms representing good and evil, meaning saved and unsaved types of people. In Job chapter 39, behemoth slays people, the beast of the field, because they're feeding on corrupt scriptures without oil. That's what's going on there. In the Song of Solomon chapter 2, Leviathan feeds corrupt scriptures to the beast of the field to preserve the judgment of damnation to the unsaved. So, he, uh, he's keeping the world drunk on the Babylonian doctrine that's dripping out of his mouth, so to speak. But it's important that people study their Bibles. They eat through faith, which means they believe what they're reading with all their heart and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and his word is true and the scripture cannot be broken. When you truly believe those things, the power of the word 
is beyond what any of us can really describe. Uh, the Holy Spirit will reveal the power to the individual that has faith. So beasts can get saved. This is the great message. And what's so exciting about this lesson is beast, in other words, people can get saved. Whom will you serve? You've got Lucifer, the god of this world, who's got everyone in captivity. We're all in this zoo held captive in these iron bars. His bones are it's, it's bars of iron, okay? And they're corrupt, and the rust of them will be a witness against us if we don't get out of prison. But there is hope. There's always hope. In Hosea chapter 2, it says, And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beast of the field. God is saying that he's going to make a covenant. Is he foreshadowing Jesus Christ there? What does it say in the uh, book of Hebrews, the New Testament? Chapter 12, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So God in his great mercy is describing all these people on earth as beasts. And he's telling them what their problems are, but he's presenting a solution. If you just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved in thy house. And he will break the bars of sun, asunder of iron and make people free by faith in Jesus Christ. But the downside here is there is a formidable servant called the king of Babylon. His name is Lucifer. And he's got an antichrist always in this world that's counterfeiting Jesus, casting doubt, creating many, many false, corrupt scriptures. And God tells us, or he asks us a rhetorical question in Job chapter 41. Will he make a covenant with thee? So in other words, is he going to counterfeit my covenant and give you flattering speech to make you think you're going to heaven or you're a good person or whatever and deceive you because the whole world is deceived and heaven is for few. Many that think they're Christians will perish and say, Lord, Lord, as it says in Matthew chapter 7. Everybody else is already condemned. You're already unsaved on your way to hell. And salvation is for few that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope you guys enjoyed this type of lesson that builds spiritual vocabulary in hopefully an encouraging way. But I wanted to show how God uses beast to give counsel to people and to describe people. And I wanted to conclude with the great news that God has a covenant. And he's going to open the eyes of many to the truth of his word, as it says in the book of Daniel. But in the meantime, we've got a world that is trying to counterfeit that says, eat my flesh for life. Get modern Bibles that are so dumbed down, they're easy to understand because you're natural and you're unsaved and you can't understand Jesus' speech. The devil knows that's your problem, so he's going to step in and dumb it down so that you can understand his voice instead of the voice of the Most High. Thank you guys for watching and listening, and I'll look forward to putting out another lesson soon.